Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this special presentation um, of, of data slayers in the new world of prospect development. Um, I hope everyone's summers have been going really well. Uh, before I jump in, I wanted to say a special thank you to Donor Search for being a longtime supporter of Afro Maryland. Um, without their support this year as premier sponsors, uh, we would not have been able to provide our monthly free programming to everyone in our community and continue to grow the content and resources for our members. Um, their support makes everything possible. And today we actually have the pleasure of also learning from them. Um, I want to welcome Nathan Chappelle, uh, Senior Vice President, and Scott Rosencrans, Associate Vice President of Donor Search, Aristotle. I'll go ahead and let you two take it from here. All right. Thanks, Teresa. I appreciate it. And welcome, everyone. It looks like we have a great crowd. So either it's a slow day for you on this Tuesday, or you're really interested in, in, in the, or maybe we caught your attention with a topic that you've probably not heard of before. Um, but we're we're excited to be here. Scott and I um, have you know, worked together to build a presentation that we think is uh, relevant um, for sure because it's really kind of setting the tone of uh, where we're at in um, in this new world. And I assume others can you can let people in, correct, Teresa? While I'm presenting, okay, so so I can stop clicking on those. Um, but uh, we really you know wanted to take a step back because uh, as a few of you were probably getting on the conversation we're talking about often these presentations are just kind of the um almost the same thing over and over again of just like the top tips or the um the, the things that you should you know you need to do we wanted to take kind of a step back and build a presentation that level sets where we're at today in um the world of big data but also in the world of prospect development fundraising uh, in terms of the skill set and um, where the job requirements are today and where they're going, since we spend almost all of our, pretty much all of our time talking about AI and, and advanced technologies, um, I just wanted to share part of that journey with you and then essentially give you some tips as well uh, around where to go as you're, um, you know, kind of uh, navigating this journey. So the topic or the the title of the presentation is Data Slayers and the New World of Prospect Development. It sounds really ominous. Um, we actually created a second title slide that we thought was way more appropriate um, that really kind of represents kind of the, this topic. And we're going to use some really cheesy, um, probably analogies here to knighthood and um, medieval times just because we're again we're probably just bored of uh old old style presentations so uh bear with us and if you don't like cheesy um kind of analogies then uh, we apologize in advance so go to the next slide scott uh, so i am again nathan chappelle senior vice president donor search aristotle spent 20 years in the fundraising seat so started out working at boys and girls clubs uh, and boys and girls of america in terms of uh, consulting I spent time as associate vice chancellor at UC San Diego, leading a, a great team there. Uh, time at CCS fundraising, uh, working as a consultant. And then my last nonprofit job was I was senior vice president philanthropy at City of Hope, at NCI designated cancer center uh, before, uh, and actually it's essentially where we started working in machine learning and AI about five years ago. And since then have worked um, in the dark side um, essentially building AI machine learning tools for the nonprofit sector. And it's been an incredible journey and um, excited to share some of that with you today. Go ahead, Scott. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott Rosencrantz. I'm AVP at Donor Search Aristotle. Uh, I started 10 years ago in the nonprofit sector, actually as a prospect researcher at the Archdiocese of Baltimore on one of their capital campaigns. So right in the area of where most of you are coming from, I assume. Um, from there, in that role, I saw how much data was being collected, but not really being used outside of anything but reporting and talking about what has happened to date. It was never really being used for forward thinking, at least not that at that organization. So I kind of leveraged my role as a way to collate data and start building predictive models. And then I took that role and, and put it more into a consulting uh, uh, responsibility, working with a few consulting firms, now finding my way at Donor Research Aristotle, focusing on these predictive models, leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence. So working with a lot of data, working with a lot of uh, exciting technology and being able to introduce a, introduce a whole new uh, generation of modeling into the sector. So nice to speak with you all today. Yeah, a lot of familiar names. I'm excited with such a great group today. 
Uh, and we're going to navigate this kind of back and forth between Scott and I. So I'll beep when I when he needs to switch sides. So um, to try to replicate kind of the in person conference, you know, we've done lots of virtual conferences. I know you've done lots of virtual conferences and sometimes they can feel very one sided. Uh, we're hoping that this is conversational and we're really trying to essentially bribe you to ask questions. Uh, so uh, I am a woodworker on my my side therapy. Um, and I have a laser engraver. So we've made these custom wood. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Hopefully you can see it. I can't see myself. So, uh, but there's a picture. We have these custom made data slayer coasters that would pimp out your desk for anyone that asks a question. And the only thing we'll need, uh, I'll be monitoring chat throughout. Um, we'll definitely, you know, we can, you can ask questions um, throughout or at the end. Um, but, or after the fact, even if you send a question to us in an email later, we're just happy to talk with people and uh, we'll, we'll re uh, reward you with a free coaster. All we need is, of course, your mailing address and we'll stick one in the mail for you. So here we go. All right, so I, we have to do the obligatory about donor search, even though it was already kind of said, um, but they do pay our paychecks and we're appreciative of, of that. Um, we, Scott and I started uh, partnering with donor search a few years ago when we were building machine learning models that were consuming lots and lots of data. Uh, we looked at all the different well screening providers and evaluated them and found that donor search had the largest philanthropic database. From a machine learning perspective, that's important because we are trying to predict which people in America are most likely to make gifts. Um, and so, uh, long, long, uh, I want to make long story, 15 year family run business down to about 30 seconds. Donor Search uh, is premier well screening uh, data analytics company. And now with Donor Search Aristotle um, really providing the most advanced machine learning uh, and deep learning analytics of, of any, uh, any well screening company with end to end from pure data all the way through visualization. So second to that, we have lots of uh, integrations that a lot of you are already clients and know that we have integrations in Blackbot and uh, Lucian and uh, DonorPerfect and, and others. So that's the obligatory. Um, we love it at DonorSearch. It's a great place. It's a big family and we're doing awesome stuff to change the world. So uh, the, the topic today is really about change and, and hopefully you've signed up today because we caught your interest, uh, but we're living in a very different world where um, you, no one could deny that uh, being able to, I hate the use of the word pivot, but the, the ability to change and adapt to change has become a currency uh, of advancing in your career. Um, this this um, phrase or this quote I've been using for a while, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. It sounds fairly stark, um, but when we go through this presentation and you see the gravity of what we're talking about, and we'll share actual examples of how different the world is um, and how what that's going to require you to adapt in that changing world, uh, I actually don't think this quote is that much of a stretch. So let's, let's talk about where we are today and what our world is looking like as a result of all this big data that's been, been going around as of late. So obviously we're in a new world order, not just because of COVID and everything that happened with the quarantine and Zoom fatigue and everything that we've been dealing with over the past 18 months. But leading up to that, we've been in a real new sea of data. 90% uh, of all data has been created in just the last two years. And the amount of data that was created from the dawn of civilization to 2003, we're creating that much every two days. So it's been vastly new data. It's all coming from various sources, right? If you think about where you were 10 years ago, you probably had a laptop and a cell phone. Now there's iPads, there's smart watches, there's smart speakers, smart TVs, smart cars. You're interacting with technology data on a day-to-day -day basis. And all that is being tracked somewhere by organizations that know how to put it to use. So every person will generate 1.7 megabytes in just a second. That means that the amount of time it took you to read the data uh, or read the text on this slide, you would have created more data to exceed the Gmail attachment size limit. Social media accounts for 33% of the total time spent online and Google gets over 3.5 billion searches daily. So Facebook and Google, obviously two of the big ones, but they don't stay just in their lane. Facebook and Google, they both know the more they know about their consumers, 
and customers, the better they can service them. That's why you'll often, when you try to sign up for a new account unrelated to Facebook or Google, you can log in with your Facebook or Google credentials because then they'll learn that more information from you and be able to pivot and pitch and approach you in different ways as a result of gaining more information on who you are as an individual. With all the data that we've created, it would take someone 181 million years to download it from the internet. It, I read another way, another perspective of looking at, at is the new iPads, they have 128 gigabytes storage. So if the digital universe was stored on iPads, back in 2006, if you stack those iPads up, they would reach two thirds of the way from the earth to the moon. But by 2025, if you stack them up, there will be 26 stacks of iPads between the earth and the moon. And that's growing exponentially. So what are organizations doing about this? What's the projection on how this is gonna to continue to move and what it means for various industries? Poor data quality costs the US economy up to 3.1 trillion yearly. That's based on time it takes to clean the data. That's based on uh, poor decision-making as a result of using that data. And then that poor decision leading to customer dissatisfaction and uh, brand um, uh, bad reputations for the brands because of the decisions they made. So all that data needs to be, it's coming in from various sources. It's unstructured, which is uh, data that can't fit easily into spreadsheets. So when you watch Netflix, when you search for a show that's on your recommendation list, if you watch a few minutes of it, then skip to another show, then pause, or go to a completely different season, all that data is being tracked, but it's not something that can easily track in on Excel or CSV files, it's all unstructured data. And that's what organizations are using because it gives you that full picture of, of who you are. So 97% of organizations are investing in this big data and artificial intelligence. Again, knowing that this is where the industry is going, this is not gonna be a, a ship that stops. It's gonna be continually amassing new data on every individual. And I'll just share uh, an example. A lot of you, um, you know, a lot of people in higher education, healthcare, healthcare is the largest area of deploying AI in big data in terms of all of AI, in, ter in terms of investment uh, is going to, in healthcare, not in fundraising, but to predict outcomes of diseases. And we were on the phone with the president of the university, the university last week, who was talking about them using AI and predicting which students are most likely to uh, except uh, income to school, but also AI to determine students that are most uh, likely to drop out. So we're seeing these changes, not just in the Googles and Amazons and the Facebooks of the world, but in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives and in the, in the places that we work. That's weird. <laughs> and while, while that <laughs> seems like... <laughs> I, I, How weird. I love the enthusiasm, Rob. Uh, <laughs> while that seems like a lot of... A, a lot of overwhelming information and you know you don't really know what to do with all that the projections for new roles and new jobs Weird. data science and data analytics will be more than 2.7 million by the end of the year and exceed 3.5 million by 2026 so obviously a huge investment in organizations to lead the charge on analyzing this data data figuring out how to use it and make sense of it so just a couple examples. Obviously, these are companies that you're familiar with, but you might not be familiar with how they're using it in their day-to-day. -day. Amazon, if you look at them at face value, they're a retail company, right? Which means that their competitors would inherently be Walmart, Target. You would go to Amazon as opposed to going to a Target store to purchase something. They see their competitors as Apple and Google. They see themselves as a data company. And they invest so much in their data that they patented predictive shipping. So they think that they're so confident with all the data they collect on you, they know what you're going to purchase before you know what you're going to purchase. There's another organization in uh, Germany named Otto, which is essentially the Amazon of Germany. They've used similar technology and their accuracy level is 90% in predicting what you're going to purchase before you do. Now they don't ship it out to you, but they bring it into the warehouse closest to you so that they can ship it out much quicker. And that quick turnaround leads to uh, 2 billion products that are not going to be returned because they got it exactly when they wanted it, when they needed it, and it's exactly what they were looking for. 
Netflix uses big data to create new content, to market better. Uh, the recommendations of what they're showing you are based on who you are as an individual, what your demographics look like, and what you've watched in the past. Even the thumbnails of the shows that they recommend to you. They might recommend the same shows to you and me, but I might get a different snapshot of what that show is or movie is based on what I've watched versus what they would show to you based on what you've watched. So for example, Goodwill Hunting. If I watch a lot of comedies, I might see a picture of Robin Williams. But if you watch a lot of romance movies, you might see a picture of Matt Damon and Minnie Driver. It's the same thing, but Netflix knows that if they market to me better and I find content that I like, I'm going to stay. And they project that their recommender systems and their big data leads to a billion dollars in savings on a yearly basis. They have the lowest churn rate. They're out of all the... the uh, subscription media companies, they're keeping their customers most satisfied because they know how to put that data to use. And then Google, we know Google is everywhere. They're using data from the very low end of improving your photos if you have an Android to improving your daily searches and know what you're going to ask before you even finish asking it, all the way to the other end of identifying eye disease better than physicians can. So they're across the board and using their technology. And a lot of these know that, the, again, the more data, the better. So they're allowing their technologies to be used by everyday people. You can go on Google and Amazon and use their algorithms to, to use to, for new applications. And that just in, improves the growth, improves the accuracy of those algorithms. So the more data, the better. They realize that the, the accuracy, the consistency leads to better decision-making as a company leads to enhanced customer satisfaction. And the more satisfied these customers are, the more money these organizations are gonna make. And that's the ultimate goal for them, right? So gong farmer or soldier. Gong farmer is a term that obviously we don't have anymore because that role was replaced by the toilet. So in a couple of slides, you'll see where we're going with this. But one quote on the projection of the workforce by McKinsey Global Institute is that due to AI and big data, 45 million of Americans will need to switch occupations by 2030. That's a lot of jobs that, that are gonna be going away as a result of automation and robotics and machine learning. But if we look on the other side of that sword, 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't even been invented yet. So, how do we know what side of the line we fall on? How do we know what category we're in and if we have to worry or if we can make room and look to where the industry is gonna to go to find one of those new positions that has yet to be created? Well, Kai-Fu Lee, who is the former president of Google China, he was an executive at Microsoft, Google, and Apple, so he knows his stuff. He wrote a book called AI Superpowers and he put different roles and responsibility and jobs on this type of spectrum. So looking across two axes, one, axi one axis is compassion or need for compassion in that role, and the other axis is creativity. So you can see here, jobs fall into kind of four different uh, quadrants on these spectrums. So that bottom left-hand category is low creativity needed, low strategy needed, and low compassion needed. A lot of these jobs can be done just based on looking at a decision tree. So radiologist, customer support, knowing how to answer someone's questions are as simple as, do they say yes to this or no to this? And then what's the next step? Usually people in customer support just have a large handbook of what scenarios they need to follow. Pretty easy, not a lot of creativity that they need in that role. Whereas on the top right, it's a complete opposite. That's a lot of creativity, a lot of strategy, a lot of compassion needed. So back to the gong farmer and soldier, soldiers would fall more on that right side, that strategy, that creativity. Gong farmers might be less on the, let's figure out a way that we can automate this because I don't know how many people want that role of a gong farmer. I don't know if anyone caught this, but I love the fact that truck driver is the lowest um, job <laughs> that's announced on compassion needed. So, uh, you know, we've all, we've all experienced that. <laughs> Um, and I will say real quick, Scott, just to interrupt, there are uh, some really great questions coming through. I'm going to hold these questions 
um, for later, because I think actually these are, are questions that others um, will benefit from hearing. We'll take a little bit of time at the end to go over that. So when, when we look at going back to those two quotes of AI replacing jobs and new jobs being created, we find that the decision is really based upon where does creativity fall, right? So for those where there's not so much compassion needed, you don't need a lot of that, the, like a religious leader or a teacher or a wedding planner or any of those where crisis hotline volunteer for, is a great example. You don't need that compassion, that empathy. When that's not needed, AI can either replace or augment. If it's something where creativity isn't a necessity, replacement is probably what's gonna happen with artificial intelligence, right? Truck driver as an example, Tesla has their own trucks. Nikola is a new automated truck driver. A lot of those jobs are gonna be replaced in the future as a result of automation, just simple decision trees that lead to a robot being able to take over. Whereas creativity, the economist, the columnist, the artist even, that's where this can be augmented by the use of machine learning. So it's gonna be humans interacting with technology and that's where that segment of the jobs that have yet to be created, 85% of those jobs yet to be created fall because we haven't seen the full spectrum of, well, what is that role going to be? Where's the line going to be between where a human acts and a machine acts? Where do we interact and how do we best interact with them? So all of us on this call, we fall over to the right side of that spectrum. There's a lot of creativity, a lot of strategy in what we do in our day to day. So we're in prime position to not just utilize artificial intelligence, but gain the benefits that these for-profit organizations have been using by bringing artificial intelligence into the fold and into the day-to-day -day of what we do to augment our, our typical work. So are nonprofits ready for AI? We all know that nonprofits typically lag about 10 years behind the for-profit sector. Right? So we know that for-profits have been using this technology for a while. 10 years ago, the iPad came out, iPad came out 11 years ago. At that point, it was just a clunky device. The app store was basic compared to what it is now. But I, if I had to guess, I would imagine 70% of the people on this call have some sort of tablet or at least a smartphone that they interact with on a regular basis, maybe even interacting with right now. So things have changed progressively in that last 10 years. So what has the, the nonprofit done as a result of seeing how artificial intelligence, big data is being used in the for-profit sector? So here's a couple of articles that are coming up that we wouldn't have been able to show. This would have been a blank slide five years ago. Nonprofits are finding the, the creative uses of artificial intelligence and how it can be applied to what they're doing. So from one end of the spectrum of using drones to deliver organs, using drones to deliver blood transfusions, or identifying poachers in the safari so that animals aren't being poached anymore. Some organizations are using artificial intelligence to properly match uh, orphan children to foster homes so that they have a better way of life, a better way of living and more successful of finding a, an adoptive home. So hundreds of use cases for these nonprofits, but again, it's, it's that lagging. They're just starting to take advantage of this technology and seeing the benefits of all that big da data that's surrounding us. A, a crazy example I just heard the other day is an organization that's using AI to predict uh, which priest would be most successful in a parish based on all the demographics and history of the parish. So we're talking AI has gone mainstream when the Catholic Church is using <laughs> it for, for placing priests. So, uh, yeah. but, but like Scott said, th this is something four or five years ago, there have been very few use cases. Now we're seeing a lot of really creative examples. Yeah. As someone who worked at the Catholic Church, if they've adopted it, adopted it, it's, <laughs> that's the peak, right? <laughs> So McKinsey and company did a report on use cases for nonprofits, right? At the point of when they created this report, which I think it, uh, this was in 2019, end of 2019, they had 160 use cases and counting. And if you take a look, you could see that based on where the majority of those use cases are, they're in that bottom left, that blue circle of health and hunger. But if you look around the circle, infrastructure, security and justice, crisis response, 
a lot of them are clearly nonprofits using it for the mission that they're focused on, which makes sense, right? But not so much on the supporting end of those missions. So I'm sure we all have a, a story of, you know, how is a hospital, local hospital, or local, local healthcare organization using artificial intelligence, whether it's uh, robotics in the surgical department, right? Or identifying best uh, areas to put staffing and put nurses and put new beds into the areas of, that are going to be reaching. And especially with COVID, you know, all the technology and all the, the uh, data around what the projections are for the, the COVID-19, all of these organizations and use cases are, are again focused on that front facing and the purpose of the organization as a whole. But they're starting to, with this, this emergence of AI in nonprofit in our industry, there's starting to be reports about it. So this quote on the bottom is from the state of AI in the nonprofit sector, which is a new study, an annual study looking at how are nonprofits using it, um, especially in philanthropy? What's the focus in philanthropy as well? So about two in five nonprofits, 42% are researching AI, but not even a third have deployed, implemented, or experimented with it. So it's a lot of that analysis paralysis, knowing that there's options, but not really knowing how to step forward, how to move forward into that space and really take advantage of it. So an example of some nonprofits that are using artificial intelligence, and actually we even have for-profits that have started nonprofits to offer their technologies, again, as we spoke about, in the nonprofit space. AI for Good is uh, put out by the United Nations of how to identify where artificial intelligence and algorithms could be used to advance uh, health, education, humanities, uh, address some of the social impact needs uh, that are challenging in, in our, our world. Uh, Google Impact Challenges and Microsoft Philanthropies are doing the same thing of offering their technology, offering their data as to nonprofits to address some of these concerns. And then we see a lot of the uh, Yale New Haven Health, Chalk Children's, Rutgers, using them for various needs, either on philanthropy and fundraising or academic, as Nathan mentioned earlier, talking about which students are most likely to attend and which students are most likely to stay and not drop out so that they can invest their resources most efficiently. So how are we using AI to solve age-old problems? Now, Aristotle doesn't really fall into the medieval gong farmer, data slayer type era, right? But he addressed these challenges uh, millennia ago, thousands of years ago. He talked about how it's challenging for anyone to decide who to give money to, how much to give, where to give, when, and in what way. So these are, these are questions that philanthropists on their end have been asking themselves and not, to, not knowing exactly how to do it, but even on the flip side, where we are as, as individuals and on the fundraising side are asking the inverse questions. Who do we ask? How much do we ask? When do we ask? For what purpose and how? And again, a question, multiple questions that have been around for thousands of years, we're now able to leverage this new technology and all the data that's around us about each one of us to help answer those questions. So you may be familiar with this Venn diagram on the left, but this is how most nonprofits have been approaching fundraising, right? As one of the use cases of where artificial intelligence and big data can come into play, most nonprofits have been re relying primarily on two data sources to determine their best prospects to determine and prioritize who they're going to approach in the future. They look at wealth indicators, how wealthy is an individual, how much money do they have to give, and they look at giving patterns. Have they given to us before or not? Now that's limiting for a number of reasons. One, it's limiting because wealth through information that, that Nathan and I have, have been looking at over the past couple of years, we've determined that wealth only has 10% of an impact on how much, on if someone's going to give in the future. It's not because they have the wealth they're going to give. It's that the wealth determines how much they will give. So it's only a 10% impact. 
and giving patterns only reply to obviously those that have given. So organizations that rely on these two data sources alone are unable to really identify new individuals. Any non-donors who get scored on this type of method, an RF, RFM, which is uh, recency, frequency, and, and monetary, or P to G, which is propensity to give, any non-donors to the organization that get scored on these are essentially going to have a zero because there's no giving pattern to analyze about them. So it doesn't allow for nonprofits to bring in new individuals into the fold. It leads to donor fatigue. It leads to that 18 month major gift officer turnover because major gift officers are seeing the same names over and over and over again and not bringing new, new individuals into the relationship with the fundraising office. So we wanna take a similar approach to what we know these for-profit companies are doing. Again, they, the more information they know about the individuals, their customers, their consumers, the better they can service them. So that's why we wanna look at past just wealth and giving patterns. We wanna look at experiential data. If you're, if you're a healthcare organization, it will be the appointments, the patient history of those individuals. If you're higher ed, it would be alumni relationships. It would be how they attended your school, what year they graduated, what degrees they graduated with. If you're a membership organization, it would be, uh, are they purchasing some of the apparel, some of the things that they could purchase from you? Are they attending events, whether in-person or virtual? Are they opening your emails? So a number of different data points that speak to how those individuals relate to you as an organization. And then we also talk about, we also bring in demographic information. So we wanna know what do those individuals look like outside of your organization? Who are they as a person? What's their family size? What's their age? What's their education level? Have they given to other organizations? Are they a donor at all? Or they've never made a philanthropic gift anywhere. And then obviously we still wanna talk about wealth indicators and giving patterns. But what we do here by combining all this data we're introducing over 800 different data points outside of client supply data to really get that full picture of who an individual is, both as a relationship to that organization and who they are outside of that organization. That allows us to do what, create an algorithm similar to this, which also overwhelming, but really just shows the depth of what we can do when we're looking at big data. Those older models, I, I used to build those older models on just limited data sources. And without machine learning and artificial algorithms, I was limited to analyzing 18 to 24 variables. So I had to kind of cherry pick what data points I, I could look at that gave me the best perspective of who, who each of the constituents are. Here, we have no limitation. We can look at any data point that we can collect on these individuals. We're taking the data that we have from uh, that client supply us along with our own donor search data. And we can, oops, sorry, we can analyze up to 10,000 features on each individual. And we can put them into these buckets that determine whether or not someone's gonna make a gift. Now, what we do, which is a, a novel approach is we create two separate models. One is for your donors, we wanna know who's most likely to make a gift within the next 12 months. And that's a rolling 12 month window. So it's always 12 months from the moment you're looking at the data because we're collecting data on a regular basis and rescoring all of your constituents. But again, we know that if we scored non-donors on the same model, they would all get zeros. So we have a different model for non-donors exclusively where we're looking at based on demographic information, based on giving to other organizations and based on their relationship to you outside of giving history, because there is none, what do they look like and how much do they look like your active donors? So all this data combined gives us really a full spectrum of looking at the constituents in a holistic view to get the best sense of what their next action is gonna be and predict how they're going to give in the future, if at all. Now that's good and all, but just telling you who's likely to give only is one edge of that double-edged sword, right? We also want to tell you, well, how much can they give? Because if you have a list of high likelihood individuals, but you don't know if they can give $50 or $50,000, you wouldn't know how to approach them. You wouldn't know how much time to invest in them and what type of ways to interact with them, whether it's through a mailing, a phone call, an email, or a face-to-face -face visit. 
So we take our data, we take our information that, that we've collected from you and also the information from our various data sources to put the individuals into this, what we refer to as the holy grail, which is uh, looking at every individual on a likelihood versus capacity spectrum. Now, the way we do this, I'm sure you're familiar with this spectrum, but we put it into a visualization that looks something like this. I can't walk through a demo because the uh, uh, capability is here, but we'd love to schedule time to walk through a demo with you. But we have a scatter plot on the left that answers the questions of likelihood on the y-axis. So the higher the score, the more likely they are to make a gift and capacity on the right axis, on the x-axis. So the further on the x-axis, the more capacity they have. And then we know the third most important question behind who's likely to give and who is capacity is, have they given before or not? So we indicate previous donors as blue throughout this visualization and non-donors prospects as orange throughout the visualization. All this is interactive. So you can draw a box around certain uh, dots on the scatter plot. You can draw a box on this top bar chart, which is distribution of donors versus prospects across Aristotle score buckets. The bottom bar chart is donors versus prospects across estimated capacity. This, it's all interactive and we built it in a way that addresses the needs of a very beginning uh, data slayer all the way up to those proficient in data that wanna dig deep into the information. So uh, I, I can't spend too much time on this. Uh, we also have all the data behind it. So it's not just looking at the visualization. We can, in a matter of clicks, we could bring you to all of your constituents on a macro level down to looking at all the relevant points on every single individual they're giving elsewhere, they're giving to you, their wealth indicators and so on. So it's a really powerful tool and puts that big data to use. Awesome, thanks Scott. And, um, and you know, in, in terms of representing, um, I'm thinking more of the Venn diagram where we, where we combine lots of data, essentially that's the process that's used for anyone that is to be a data slayer, for any organization that's gonna deploy machine learning, they're doing that using machine learning because machine learning has this inherent capability of consuming lots and lots of data from different data sources and producing better predictions than you could have ever got. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect is learning and those machine learning models get better over time. So a very different way of thinking about how you're, you're thinking about your data, um, not just as a static data set that's only valid for one day, but that that data continues to learn and get better. So we want to provide some practical examples uh, for you to become a prospect development data slayer. So there's this uh, quote from um, head of IBM saying AI is not going to replace managers, but managers that use AI will replace those that do not. Uh, this is something I, I spoke to my prospect development team uh, probably five years ago at City of Hope and said, you all really need to prepare yourself for a changing world where business intelligence is at the forefront, where you are mastering data not to say that you need to be a data scientist, but you really need to understand how the data can be used. So we're going to go through some practical examples um, and also some places where you can find that. So with all of the data that Scott shared in terms of the growing trend to rely on, you know, um, well, you can't avoid, avoid the fact that big data is everywhere, that you're overwhelmed with data sources and uh, structured and unstructured data. At the same time, fundraising is becoming harder. And we do a lot of talks on this, but essentially this idea that fewer and fewer Americans are making gifts, which means that your pool of prospects is actually shrinking. So you need to really outsmart your competition from a nonprofit sector for sure, because that pool is shrinking. You have to harness the data better. At the same time, expectations from your constituents on how you know them and how um, they expect you to know them and understand their preferences is increasing and will continue to increase as long as Amazon and, and others are, are predicting behaviors as well as they are. Those donors expect that you should be able to do the same thing. And the, there's no magic behind it. It's just math. But Amazon does that by consuming lots of data to make those, those uh, predictions about who you are. So we can go to the next slide. I want to definitely leave 10 minutes for some Q&A. Um, this is something that essentially is, as we're talking from a practical perspective on how you um, set up a more modern day uh, fundraising shop to maximize business intelligence. I love the term, first of all, giving sciences and this 
I, I actually hope more organizations adopt this term to represent their department, whether it's prospect development, uh, prospect research, giving sciences is, in my opinion, kind of a new, uh, better term for the science of fundraising that goes behind, um, really uh, behind all of this. Unscaled speaks to the term of treating people on an individual basis, not treating, you know, even cohorts of people or segments of people, but using data to really um, refine predictions based on an individual. Uh, I, I can't take credit for that. Um, the diagram here, I actually stole it from UCLA when I was at UC San Diego, but essentially it's um, how a private sector organization would set themselves up with subject matter expertise in different domains. And one, one thing that I think nonprofits suffer from a lot is everyone tries to be everything for everyone. You try to be a subject matter expert in, in prospect research and prospect um, development and, um, and in fundraising versus owning a domain that is yours, that you are the expert in. So then the way I um, have structured teams in the past, building prospect development as a three-legged stool. One, just focus on business intelligence, a group of people that their, their lens is only on looking at mining data uh, to build uh, analysis and predictions. The other is prospect research. So hardcore research still has a very big place to get to know individuals better, but it doesn't mean that a researcher has to be an expert in business intelligence. And then the third leg of the stool is essentially people who translate that intelligence and research back into fundraising speak. So working as internal coaches, if you will, taking that data and being a central point of, of from fundraiser into prospect development or giving sciences. We can go to the next slide. Um, so this just, again, speaks to the same thing, that is this idea of subject matter expertise. And for each person, every pro one I've ever met in prospect development has an area that they like more than others. Those are the areas of their passion, the areas that they're better at. And our I, our premise here is that you should take those things that you're passionate about, those things that you're good at, and expand your knowledge of those to become that subject matter expert in one of those three legs of the stool. So whether it's a portfolio liaison, was you're like an internal coach slash consultant to the fundraising team, or um, you're a prospect researcher and you're leveraging technology to do, and there's a, a question in the Q&A about this, we'll talk about in a second, how do you harness all this data to actually um, not get bogged down by it, but to use it to your advantage. And then the other is around, around giving sciences is business intelligence. Um, it can go everything from being an analyst to a data scientist. Uh, next slide. Um, and just to highlight how, um, you know, we are not, um, the nonprofit sector is, is um, not, uh, um, I can't even think of the right word, not they're part of the, the 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 world out there. Like we we we're not the same constraints apply to the nonprofit sector in terms of the skills that are being demanded. Geez, that took a while to get out. The top skills from LinkedIn for 2021 are broken out into soft skills and hard skills. And this is where I've always really liked to think about the art and science of philanthropy, the art of fundraising. Truly, fundraisers have to be creative and persuasive and collaborative and adaptable, have to have strong EQ uh, and, uh, and, um, and just be able to resonate and, and uh, work with people to build those relationships. But the hard skills, it's amazing. Seven out of 10 of the hard skills for 2021 that you find on LinkedIn or Monster or anywhere you go are around computing business intelligence. So blockchain hit uh, the top 10 for the first time this year, cloud computing, analytical reasoning, uh, AI, uh, user experience design, business analysis, scientific computing. So this is a word that, world that we're competing in, and this is a world that the nonprofit sector has this opportunity to be a subject matter expert in some of these, um, some of these areas to really lead your organization uh, to be top notch in the giving sciences. Go to the next slide. So this is where it actually probably hits home. The holy grail is that just, um, just talking about these skill sets is one thing, but to actually see how these skill sets actually help you earn more money is another. So in the private sector, which will translate to the nonprofit sector, it just takes a little longer, is proficiency in tech, tech translation. So really understanding the technology and enablement leads to 20% chance of earning higher income. Profici proficiency in data science and statistics is 16% chance of higher income. So this definitely translates because organizations are prioritizing data 
and using data to, I mean, even if they don't understand it, they understand the need to prioritize and harness big data to make decisions, they will pay a premium for that. And I will tell you, as someone that I, I talk to a lot of recruiters, I get a lot of uh, recruiters asking if I know people in the space that uh, would be good to put into, um, you know, modern day and innovative nonprofit or giving sciences team. There is very few people out there that are have really um, owned this these different areas to become subject matter experts. There's a huge opportunity for any of you on this call to um, to go and train yourself up for this. We'll go to the next slide um, to basically share that there's no excuses why you shouldn't. There are. This is not a thing where you have to go back to college. You don't have to get a PhD. There's something like fifteen thousand or more than fifteen thousand online classes specifically around data analysis, most of which are free. Coursera, we had actually a data scientist that when we first started, he was he works in Silicon Valley, makes a million dollars a year. His training essentially is just um, in, in computer systems, but he took 14 different classes in Coursera and that's how he trained himself to become an expert in machine learning. And now he's paid by Google, he's paid by lots of different companies to do, to do work for them. But from Google Classroom to LinkedIn Learning to Skillshare to Coursera, there's no excuse where you can't start to become a data slayer, where you can start to improve your expertise. And if you're smart about it, you'll take any of those credentials. Like with Coursera, if you pay the 50, if you don't pay anything, it's free. But if you pay the $50 or $35, whatever, uh, it gives you a certificate that doesn't expire. And you can put that on your, your resume, your LinkedIn. Um, it's a great opportunity. I encourage it for everyone that is in the space that wants to uh, add more value to organizations, um, enhance your career without having to spend a lot of money and doing it, frankly, in your spare time. All right. So I here's our email addresses for asking questions. I want to go back to some of these questions. And it's perfect. I wanted to leave 10 minutes at the end. Um, I was really happy to see a question. Or, or, well, and actually, I'll group these together around GDPR. Um, and privacy, security, and ethics. I think we'll we'll kind of group all those together. Um, there was a question earlier, and I'm I'm trying to I don't know if I could scroll through to find out who asked it. Um, but again, send me your your address, and we'll send you a coaster. Um, GDPR and and um, and all the other privacy. So GDPR relates to privacy, data privacy in Great Britain. Um, but there are many states in the United States that have their own privacy laws. Uh, so far, those privacy laws are um, uh, are basically relegated to the, the private sector, not the nonprofit sector. But anyone in our industry will probably say two things. Um, they will be applied to the nonprofit sector sooner or later. Um, there may or may not be a federal law uh, around data privacy that would apply to nonprofits and for profits. But even if not, I would say that anyone in our space would, would suggest that nonprofits should hold themselves to the same uh, accountability to the private sector. Because essentially one breach in privacy uh, in the nonprofit sector affects everyone. So there was a, uh, an article that I posted on LinkedIn the other day, how uh, Scott found it actually, that Twitter's algorithms are racist, ageist, ableist, Islamophobic. Uh, if you didn't see it, check it out because it's horrifying. And if that was written by uh, about an algorithm at just we'll use any example, um, St. Jude or American Red Cross or or any you know very well respected national or multinational nonprofit, people would have a horrible reaction to that. So I would argue that the issues of privacy, security, and ethics are the three most important topics facing big data in the nonprofit sector right now. In fact, we're launching an initiative called Fundraising AI that is intended to be a 100% not owned by anyone collaborative brain trust that is centered around those three topics because there's no organization in the United States that focuses on privacy, security. I think we have somebody not on mute, um, but there's no organization, um, no group so far that is really driving either best practices, doing research or trying to disseminate information. Um, so we're all learning together uh, what's going on kind of on a case-by-case -case basis. I would say direct mail companies are probably um, the closest to this right now, following it state by state. Uh, most likely it will end up with people having to opt in 
GDPR is a massive change. Nonprofits in the UK lost 50% of their constituents, even though they had three years to prepare, they lost 50% of their constituents overnight when GDPR was enacted and made uh, essentially constituents opt-in. I'm not saying that will happen, but if it does happen, um, we should be ready for that. And with that said, um, you should really, you know, um, have your best uh, practices. I mean, HIPAA, anyone who works in healthcare already does. Um, anyone who's not in healthcare should act as if they are in healthcare. Um, I, the other question around uh, privacy relates to bias. And this is where AI can be used for a lot of good, and it can also be used for a lot of bad if not done responsibly. There's a nonprofit, nonprofit now called Responsible AI that is essentially a certification program for building AI systems that are responsible in that they are mindful around bias. Done well, actually AI can reduce bias. Um, and, and I'll explain why in that um, if you're building a regression model, a typical RFM or a PDG score like Scott was talking about, no matter who you are, or what you're trying to do, those models are inherently biased because they're limited to a, a small set of data. So if a regression model typically uh, can use 18 or 24 data points before it starts to perform worse. So by only using 18 or 24 data points, you're introducing bias inadvertently to the model by saying these are the most important data points. So done well, machine learning has that opposite effect where you can use, like Scott said, we can use up to 10,000 calculations per person. And by doing that, um, as long as there's very stringent review processes that essentially different features, um, a feature is a calculation in machine learning, uh, making sure that they're not duplicated um, and they're not biasing a model. And there's lots of automation that's coming out in the world of AI that actually looks for bias. It's a really, really hot topic in the world of AI and machine learning is um, not just having smart people look and um, go through line by line to see which where biases could be introduced, but also using new AI algorithms that are actually assessing bias. Uh, one of the tools that we use has an automation that looks at uh, bias within models, um, not to replace humans. I really would say this is like the equivalent of using AI in radiology. AI actually can predict, predict a uh, a solid tumor, I think 27% greater than a human can. So you would think, well, let's just use AI to do that all day long. But actually when they use AI plus a human radiologist, they actually increase up, upon that 27%. Similar in this area of bias that it has to be smart people, um, objective people with the machine actually looking at where biases could exist. But it's a really, really big topic. I would say my biggest concern about um, the nonprofit sector adopting lots of AI very quickly is that they use AI um, irresponsibly um, and introduce bias, but also use it um, in a way that doesn't help build relationships. And uh, so on that, on that kind of soapbox of mine, I really focus on AI or any automation uh, being used where it can actually enhance relationship versus making giving more transactional. And we can look across the pond to see how fundraising ends up when it's transactional, because in Europe, giving is far more transactional than relational, because it's become only around sustainers, it's become only around becoming a member um, as your civic duty versus around building a partnership and relationship. And our premise is that done well, you can use all the big data that exists around an individual and all of the uh, the fast computing to build that relationship in a, a better way and a faster way than other ways. So Scott, I assume you've been looking at the different chats. So is there other questions while I was talking that we need to address? Yeah, there were some good questions. Um, I assume the algorithms you use are proprietary. How can we know and trust the data if we don't really know what it was based on? That is a great question. You do want to make sure that you you trust the data, you trust what recommendations are being are being made. And so we're able to, with, with our algorithms, we're able to show you exactly why each individual got the score that they got, all the different data behind it, uh, the giving to you, the engagement with you, giving to other organizations, and so on. So we, we do want to make this as transparent as possible, knowing that trust in AI is a big factor, like Nathan was referring to. 
And I know we have we have two minutes, and and I will um, just say all these questions will be answered. So um, we will answer them in the email to you. Questions about donor search and Aristotle specifically. Um, you know, we're better, but um, I, we can't just say that. We'd love to be able to share and and show you why we're better. Um, we truthfully, Scott and I are two kids in a candy store at Donor Search. Our our premise is around using AI to in, increase philanthropy worldwide. Um, we love being at the central source of being able to harness all that data. And um, of course, we're extremely biased, um, but we're we're pretty far ahead. And only because we've been doing this for almost five years now and essentially filed the first two patents on gratitude prediction using machine learning a few years ago. So um, I say we're better, but, you know, I, I take that with a grain of salt because I'm, I'm really biased. Um, I know we're we're at time. I, is there any is there one last question we want to answer or are we going to get shut off here? And I don't know if people are just asking questions because of free swag. And if so, that's totally cool. Like, I love it, you know? So uh, I do the same thing. So we're ex excited. Um, yeah, uh, we, we have plenty of time to answer as many questions as you want. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, well, excellent. Um, uh, which data privacy is there how much of big data will be able to utilize moving forward? You know, um, so that is one of the last questions I asked. So with data privacy, a concern, how much big data will be able to be utilized moving forward? And the answer is lots. It turns out in fundraising, and, and so just follow me on this, that people give, so giving is a very personal thing, right? Giving is very visceral. It's about how you feel about an organization, how you align with that organization, whether your values are aligned, um, if you've experienced that organization as a volunteer or your friends have. Um, and you know, in in all of our work, and in, in Scott and, and my work, it turns out that a person's experience is around eighty percent of the decision that someone will make a gift. So we've gotten very good at predicting which individuals will make a gift in the next twelve months in real time, like up to that day, based on that experiential data. Now, in the world of big data that this is referring to, there there might be constraints on not being able to get certain maybe. I mean, political giving is a, a good example, but political giving is open source data. Um, it's public availability. If it became non-publicly available, it would affect these models, but not extensively because a majority of the ability for you to predict which donors are, are like you, the, are most engaged, that like you the most, that are most likely to make a gift is based off any kind of experiential data. We recently built a model and it turns out for a university that um, it, it is granular as how many emails did someone uh, alumni receive to how many emails did they open to actually the percentage of alumni newsletters being open. It turns out that that specific detail, alumni newsletters being open, was one of the top predictions of whether or not someone would make a gift. And that type of data insight is, is great, but it also lets you think strategically about what's the effort I'm going to put into that alumni newsletter because it's no longer just a thing that I've got to check the box on because we do it because everyone does it. And if we don't do it, people will get pissed. It's a thing that this is our number one conversion from someone becoming a non-donor to a donor. You start to think about content and delivery. Um, we built another model this week actually um, for uh, 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 an organization that is in the food uh, scarcity world. And it actually, we picked up on even the very time of day that people make donations. So the, the day of the week, but also the time of day. So the insight that you get um, using this big data, it doesn't have to be outsourced data. It's all internal data. 80% of it is, is internal to you. So there's not a lot of risk that that's going to go away. And so to, to jump off of that and answer another question that was in the chat, uh, because we're collecting the data that's specific to each organization, we're looking at, like Nathan said, the email data, the event data coming from that organization that we're building the model for, we're answering how likely is the person to make a gift to that organization. Not necessarily what is their affinity to make gifts in higher ed, but what's their likelihood to make a gift to that higher ed institution specifically. Yeah. And, and with that said, so I know someone asked a question like, how is this different from sector to sector? Um, it, it's true. Sectors like healthcare, um, there's differences in timing of gifts, um, all the way down to, in our case, we predict all the way down to which physician did they see in which department, because if you're seen in cardiovascular, your experience is very different than dermatology. 
Um, in higher ed, it's a bit more around what was the experience of an individual while they were in school versus as an alum. So tracking both kind of that, that ancillary data. But we actually are working with a client that's a national membership organization around gun safety. And they have members across the nation. They do a lot of education. People buy stuff in their store. Um, so every organization that we've ever worked with, um, by just doing a little bit of brainstorming, um, is able to find lots of data that's relevant um, around the uh, personal experience. Every organization curates data around donor experiences that can be mined for machine learning. We haven't found an organization that doesn't. And if there is one, I'd be I'd love to know how you do it because that would be amazing. Um, I, I'm being cognizant of being over time. I'm sure people are having to, a lot of people have already dropped off. Um, we yes, will send, a, oh, go ahead. Oh, I said we're going to send, send the deck and continue to answer questions um, um, online if that's okay. Yep, perfect. Okay. Well, um, again, just thank you everyone for coming and thank you so much, Nathan and Scott. And thank you again to Donor Search for making all of our programming possible this year. Um, I figure this is actually also a perfect time to let everyone know what else is coming up over the next couple of months from Upper Maryland. Um, and because of Donor Search, we're able to provide all this content to for free. Um, so there is one more spot available for our virtual fireside chat on August 25th at 2 p.m. Um, Upper Maryland Advisory Board members Caitlin and Kelly will be hosting a conversation on maintaining work-life balance. Uh, we have another webinar coming up in September on September 15th at 1.30. We will be hosting Darren Cooper, who is the Director of Prospect Research at the Mayo Clinic for a webinar on the role of psychology in prospect research and strategy. On September 28th, there will be an international research webinar in partnership with other Mid-Atlantic Afro chapters. Uh, stay tuned to your email for registration and further details about that. We also have another webinar scheduled on October 15th about how to become a certified fundraising executive, which I know I'm very excited about because this is something I've been working towards for a while. And then last but not least, um, everyone save the date for the fall Afro Maryland conference, uh, which will be taking place on November 8th and 9th. Um, so again, thank you everyone. I know um, you will be receiving both um, the slide deck as well as a link to recording in your email sometime um, in the next couple of days. And again, thank you so much, Nathan and Scott, for coming in and sharing all this information with us. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks all. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye.